can you use artificial intelligence to hack into the brains of IBTOK examiners to understand how they make decisions when they're marking an essay? Can you give the machine a large collection of good and bad TOK essays and ask it to figure out what the main difference between the good ones and the bad ones? Can this help you understand how TOK essays are marked and what examiners are looking at when they're marking an essay? Can you use machine learning to reverse engineer excellent TOK essays and understand what exactly makes them excellent? Can you teach the computer to read and mark a TOK essay with a degree of accuracy that would be comparable to that of a human examiner? Can you build an algorithm that will mark TOK essays automatically, that will learn from humans at first, but then become autonomous and mark on its own? And even can you teach a computer to write a TOK essay for you? These are all the questions I will try to answer in this video by actually trying to do all these things. Well, almost all of them. I'm Alexei Popov. You might have already seen my videos uh, on the TOK exhibition and the TOK essay, as well as my TOK Explained series. If not, check them out by following the link to the full YouTube playlist in the description below. You might have also seen my textbooks for psychology and TOK, and I hope you find them useful. Most of my videos so far have been created to support our recent TOK textbook, but this one is a special edition. It's a little summer project of mine where I try to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to understand what makes a good TOK essay. I don't think anything like this has ever been done before. Well, similar things have been done, obviously, but not with the TOK essay. My other passion, apart from teaching IB and writing textbooks, is data crunching. And a number of years ago, I spent some time working as a psychometrician at a company that dealt with personnel management and consulting. So naturally, whenever I have a bit of spare time, I try to revive old interests and combine all these areas together. This summer, I had a bit of spare time, so I continued my coding lessons in Python and I brushed up on some latest developments in the areas of text mining and NLP, which stands for Natural Language Processing. It took me five weeks to get to the point where I am now. There are some thought-provoking results that I will cover in this video, and I'm determined to continue and achieve even better results by feeding more data into my algorithm and making it smarter. I invite you on this journey with me. Before I begin, though, there's some background information I need to explain so that everything else makes sense. So how does marking in IBTOK work? The TOK essay is a piece of writing with a word limit of 1600 words that is externally assessed. That is, it's allocated anonymously to an external examiner. There's a special rubric called the TOK assessment instrument against which examiners mark your essay on a scale from 0 to 10 and it uses the general impression marking, meaning that examiners mark the essay holistically without using separate criteria. Obviously, a common criticism of this approach is that such marking is very subjective, and it depends a lot on the individual examiner and the impression that they get from your essay. While this is true, there is also a mechanism in the IB to reduce the influence of such subjectivity. I'll try to explain how it works. There's a person called principal examiner. This person thoroughly knows the requirements of the course and the assessment criteria. IB has one principal examiner in every subject. Apart from that, there are also team leaders and assistant examiners. Every year, roughly 100,000 IB students submit their TOK essays, and the IB has to mark all this heap of essays in two to four weeks. So this is what happens. The principal examiner marks a number of these essays. I don't know how many exactly, but I want to say several hundred. They also write comments to explain their marks. Then the team leaders take the same essays and mark them independently. Their marks are compared to those of the principal examiner. If there's a discrepancy, it's discussed. The assumption here is that the principal examiner sets the marking standard, and the job of the team leaders is not to debate these marks but try and understand the marking standard 
of the principal examiner and to replicate it. And there is one more round of marking. And if the team leader's marks are getting closer to the marks of the principal examiner, then it is said that the team leader has understood and internalized this marking standard and is now ready to mark. If the discrepancy persists, then the team leader is not allowed to continue marking. Team leaders who passed are given their own team of assistant examiners and the cycle repeats. Assistant examiners are only allowed to continue if their marks are roughly the same as the marks of the principal examiner. And in TLK, plus minus one mark out of 10 is considered an acceptable discrepancy. There's a qualification round first where all the essays you read have been pre-marked by the principal examiner. If you passed, which means if your marks were the same, then you're allowed to continue. But even so, roughly 10% of all the essays you mark seeds, uh, which means that they have already been marked by the principal examiner. And you know, you, you never know which ones are the seeds. So if you mark a seed differently from the principal examiner, you may be stopped from marking and the team leader discusses the discrepancies with you, making sure you understand the marking standard. But if discrepancies persist, you're stopped from marking. So this is the mechanism that the IB uses to ensure that all essays are marked to the same standard. What they mean by that essentially is that everybody needs to mark in the same way as the principal examiner does. This way it's more fair to everybody. And while it makes sense. But look, I'm a psychologist, so let's try to look at this from a psychological perspective. Marking an essay is an expert judgment. It has a degree of intuition in it. The thing with expert judgments is they're difficult to explain to others. Experts are people whose knowledge is to a large extent implicit. It means that they find it difficult to verbalize it. Ask a mathematical genius, for example, how they do what they do, and they will find it really difficult to explain. Or ask a talented artist how they make their artwork so unique. And in response, they will say something vague, like, this is how I see the world, man. Or ask a really good teacher to explain to beginners how to be good at teaching, and advice will not be so useful. It doesn't work this way with implicit knowledge. It is difficult to verbalize and transfer to other people. And it's the same with expert examiners. They know a good essay or a bad essay when they see one, but they can't always easily explain to new examiners why they marked the way they did. So that's why the IB ensures that those examiners that do not intuitively grasp this marking standard just get eliminated. There's a special field of research in psychology known as knowledge engineering. It consists of various techniques that are designed to make implicit expert knowledge more explicit, verbalized, formalized, and accessible to laypersons. They use observation, interviews, simulations, think aloud protocols, and other methods to understand exactly how experts think, because experts themselves can't explain. Now, another thing about thinking, human thinking in general, and experts in particular, is that it uses lots of heuristics. Heuristics are simplified rules or cognitive shortcuts. Think about an expert chess player, for example. When it's your turn to make a move in chess, there are loads of possibilities to calculate. The way computers play chess is exactly like that. They sift through thousands of possibilities and their outcomes, and they can think one, two, three, five, ten, twenty, a hundred moves ahead. But no human can ever do that due to the natural limitations of our brain, for example, the limited capacity of our working memory. Instead, humans use simplified shortcuts. For example, they have a rule to always move pawns forward if there's a capacity to move them. And the rule could be something like, in any dangerous or suspicious situations, move your pawns forward, or something like, prevent the queen from getting eaten. We rely on these simplified rules because although, strictly speaking, they're not 100% justified, they have been successful in the past, so we have reasons to rely on them. They save us a lot of mental energy, and at the same time, they keep the accuracy of our decisions at a sufficiently high level. So what I'm trying to say here is that, in all probability, IB examiners use some simplified rules or heuristics. In most cases, they're not even aware of them. They're implicit, 
And let's face it, TOK examiners operate under limited time and resources. Most of them do the marking in addition to their regular job. And we're talking 200 to 400 essays in the space of two to four weeks. They don't have much time to read and understand your essay. And if they can use some simplified strategies to decide how many marks it is worth, most of them will. So to hack into the brains of examiners, all we have to do is to uncover or rather reverse engineer these simplified rules. But it is, of course, difficult because examiners themselves may not be fully aware of them. So what am I trying to achieve here? Suppose there's an IBTOK examiner out there who has a bunch of implicit heuristics. For example, if a student uses a lot of TOK concepts, such as knowledge, justification, evidence, or bias, then the essay is usually good. Or if a student uses complicated examples from fields like quantum mechanics, then the student is usually smart and the essay is good. Or if the student writes in long sentences, then the essay usually produces a good impression. Or if the student considers various perspectives and cause-effect links using words such as however, therefore, on the other hand, implications, then the essay is usually argumentative and analytical. I'm just making it all up at this point, but suppose such an examiner is marking TOK essays. They have lots of essays to mark and too little time. So they scan through your essay and see, well, there's lots of words like consider and therefore. So the student clearly considers various perspectives. And the examples seem fancy and there's lots of TOK terminology. At this point, the general impression may begin to form in their brain. And that's what might dramatically influence your mark. Now, obviously, the examiner will never admit that these are the rules they're using when marking. They will claim that their reading and understanding of your essay is much more profound than that. But it could be the case that they use these strategies without being aware of them. And it could be the case that the first impression is formed on the basis of these simple rules, while further in-depth reading is only used to confirm the first impressions. Suppose also that it so happens that many of these heuristics are actually pretty accurate in most situations. For example, students who write in longer sentences indeed have a tendency to score higher marks. Or students who use the word however more often indeed have a tendency to write essays that are more analytical rather than descriptive, which again means better marks. If that is the case, then the examiner's marking, although it's based on unconscious simplified rules, may coincide with the marking of other examiners and also the principal examiners who might actually be using the same or similar heuristics. So that's the rationale behind my little project. In the rest of the video, I'm going to try to hack into the brains of TOK examiners by reverse engineering these simplified rules that they might be using when marking your essays even if examiners themselves cannot always explicitly verbalize these rules. If we uncover these simplified rules and make them more explicit, we might understand more about what makes a good TOK essay good from the point of view of an examiner's implicit, intuitive, expert judgment. To accomplish all this, I will use algorithms of natural language processing and machine learning. They're both computational techniques and they're based on turning texts into numbers and analyzing the relationships between them. I'm going to use Python as the language for coding and various extensions of Python that deal with natural language processing on the one hand and machine learning models on the other hand. My input is a collection of 120 TOK essays from my school. That's what graded in the IB in May 2021. And obviously I know the final IB marks for each of these essays. I hope my database grows in the future and the predictive models that I'm trying to create will become more accurate. Artificial intelligence learns every time new data becomes available. So the trick here is to set up a model that has a capacity to learn and to self-improve. So the plan for the rest of the video is, in part one, pre-processing. Here I'm going to describe the pre-processing that I have done on all the texts, such as removing special symbols, lemmatization, and removing all words that are not nouns, verbs, adjectives, or adverbs. A lot depends on how well you have cleaned the texts before turning them into numbers. 
So that's what I'm describing here. Part two is called term frequency. Here I'm going to describe the results of a simple numerical analysis using the so-called TF-IDF metric. It stands for term frequency inverse document frequency. With this metric, I tried to find out which words or combinations of words are used in good essays more frequently than in bad essays. Some words are only used in good essays and very rarely appear in bad essays and vice versa. And I tried to uncover these unique words and their combinations. I will show you 100 words that I identified as the most different between good TOK essays and bad TOK essays. And the cool stuff in this part will be the list of most unique words. And some interesting insights, I must say, many of which I didn't quite expect. Part three is called topic mining. Here, I'm going to use automatic topic recognition to identify the common topics discussed in TOK essays. And then I will try and compare good and bad essays in terms of the most frequently occurring topics. For this, I will use the technique called LDA, Latent Dirichlet Allocation. I will give you a gist of how it works. Then I will show you some visualizations that demonstrate the most common themes discussed in TOK essays in response to May 2021 prescribed titles. I will try looking at different prescribed essay titles separately and at good and bad TOK essays separately. The cool stuff in this part of the video will be the visualizations and the fact that the algorithm identified the six prescribed essay titles without any prior knowledge about them. Part four is called automatic essay scoring. In a sense, this is the pinnacle of my entire summer project. Here I'm going to build a model to perform the task of binary classification. It will read essays and decide on the basis of numerical analysis if the essay is good or bad. In other words, the algorithm is going to mark the essay. I will then compare the machine's predictions to the actual marks that the essays received from the IB examiners. And let's see how successfully I will be able to train the machine to score IBTOK essays automatically. I will also compare this to the accuracy of human predictions. How does a machine compare to a human teacher when it comes to predicting what mark a TOK essay will get from IB examiners? What is cool about this part of the video is that I will show you that a machine can outperform human teachers in marking a TOK essay. It's quite a large video and sometimes it may get a little more technical than you'd like. Please use the table of contents below to jump to the next section if you want to skip something. And I will also try to place convenient headings throughout this video so that you can easily see which of the parts I'm currently on. Enjoy. Okay, without further ado, part one, pre-processing of texts. There's a lot of junk that you want to get rid of in the essays before turning texts into numbers. You need to clean up the text so that the information contained in them is as meaningful as possible for the analysis, and also to get rid of all the information that introduces unnecessary noise. Some things here I did programmatically, and some things I have to do manually. So initially I had 120 essays in PDF format, I used an online service to convert all PDF files into simple texts with UTF-8 encoding. It actually resulted in some issues because apparently some PDFs were created by students using non-standard software. So I had to remove a couple of essays and the resulting corpus for my analysis is only 109 essays. Um, from all the essays, I removed things like title pages, page numbers, bibliography lists at the end, and footnotes to various websites, and so on. I did all this manually. It took me less than an hour. If I have a larger sample of essays, I will have to obviously write a script that does all that automatically. Now, the next few steps here are done pro programmatically, and I will show you the code in a minute. I removed all special symbols and footnotes. It removed multiple line breaks, replacing them with one single line break. Removed multiple white spaces, replacing them with just one white space. I made sure there's a, a white space after every dot or a question mark so that words don't get glued together. I also replaced all question marks with dots. 
Then I lemmatized all the words in all essays. Lemma is the grammatically basic form of the word. So, for example, the lemma of the word criminals is criminal, and the lemma of the expression would have gone is go. Then I sifted all the essays through a list of so-called stop words. Um, stop words are essentially words that bear no substantial meaning, such as articles, auxiliary verbs, a, the, is, are, and so on. Finally, I used some uh, built-in functions in Python to automatically recognize parts of speech for all the, for all the words. And I removed all words that are not nouns or verbs or adjectives or adverbs. I figured it would probably make little sense to look for prepositions or conjunctions that are more frequently used in good essays than in bad essays. Um, so these are the bits of code that do these things. Um, this bit of code, for example, uh, removes double spaces and removes all line breaks after letters and white spaces and commas and replaces question marks with dots, um, double breaks with single breaks and so on. Uh, this bit of code here removes all stop words and as you could see I can also add my own words that I consider stop words and I added uh, such things as HTTP, URL, essay and retrieved. Um, because these are the words that frequently met in uh, footnotes and links that I didn't really want to analyze. Um, this bit of code here catches all biograms. Uh, yeah, actually, for some types of analysis, I also uh, identified the commonly uh, used biograms, combinations of words, for example, uh, noun phrases, and so on. And this bit of code does the lemmatization with a um, um, package that is called Spacey. And as you can see here, I only left nouns and adjectives and verbs and adverbs uh, in, the, in, in the final texts. So as a result of all this, my texts got cleaned up. And this is an example of how a paragraph uh, gets turned into something more ready for an analysis. So it used to be this. However, there are also instances where trust is not prevalent in being able to accept knowledge as truth, and it becomes something like that. However, also instance where trust be prevalent, be able, accept knowledge, truth. So as you see, we have removed uh, things like there are, instances becomes instance, uh, is not becomes be, in being becomes be able, and so on. So let's go over to part two of this video, uh, term frequency. Uh, that is words that are most frequent in bad TOK essays and good TOK essays. Um, I will cover three things here. I will talk you through some technical details and I will briefly present the results the main results and what we may consider to be additional results. So technical details to start with. Uh, one detail I forgot to mention before is uh, I have used the words bad essays and good TOK essays several times now, but what do I mean by that exactly? So for the purposes of this project, what I did was I considered all essays that got uh, seven or above from the IB good, and I considered all essays that got four or below from the IB to be bad essays. And uh, for many of the analyses, I actually removed all the essays that received five or six from the IB. Uh, so I kind of threw out the middle. Uh, I could have used a different cutoff, but I thought that cutting out the middle, level five and six essays, will allow me to compare the extremes more vividly. In some other analyses uh, that you will encounter further on in this video, I actually used a different cutoff where I just drew the line between 5 and 6 and analyzed these two parts separately. Um, okay, I must explain what the metric does. TFIDF stands for Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency. For each document, which in this case means each TOK essay, 
And for each word in each document, we can calculate the term frequency, which is simply how many times a word appears in this essay. So suppose that this is your essay. It only consists of two sentences. Cats have whiskers. I really want to have a cat. We should go and get one. Uh, so you can list all the words that are used in this essay, and you can count the number of times these words are used in the essay. And that will be your term frequency, right? Uh, but uh, term frequency by itself is not too meaningful because, as you can see from this table, for example, the word have uh, is used in the first essay about cats, in the second essay about dogs, and in the third essay about equality. So although certain words may be used frequently in your particular essay, it's not very meaningful if these same words also occur a lot of times in some other documents. So we need to adjust our metric for inverse document frequency, which is basically how many times the same term appears in other documents. So um, term frequency is how many times a word occurs in the given essay, and document frequency is in how many other essays the word is used. TFIDF combines these two parameters in a single metric, and it results in a coefficient that is useful for electing words that have some uniqueness to a given essay. For example, your essay might have a lot of common words like have or should or go, but these words are also present in most other essays. So uh, they, they're, not too me they're not too representative of your particular essay, although they're frequently used. And because of that, they will get a low TFIDF score. On the other hand, if your essay uh, focuses on the problem of equal rights, for example, and you use the word equality pretty often, uh, but few of the other essays do, for example, as you can see here, only the third essay uses the word equality two times, then the word equality in this particular essay will get a high TFIDF score. And it can be said that this word is representative of your essay. Uh, fair enough, because as compared to other essays, the third essay here is about equality. That's what makes it stand out. Uh, and the first essay is about cats, and the second essay is about dogs. So it's very easy to list all the words that can be encountered in all the essays in my corpus. And if you're curious, there are uh, a sum total of 2,981 2, unique words in my whole corpus of 190 OK essays. This is after cleaning and removing all stop words. So uh, 100 students collectively in their essays used only approximately 3,000 meaningful English words. Um, and this is my whole corpus of 109 essays. It's also fairly easy to calculate 2,981 TFIDF scores for each of the essays. And this is what this TFIDF matrix basically does. If a word was never used in your essay, you will get a zero score for that word. For example, if word 2 is never used in essay 1, it will receive a zero score. If you use a particular word very frequently, whereas none of, none, none of the other essays ever mention it, you will get a score that is close to 1, but most words will receive scores somewhere in between. So as a result of that, you get this TFIDF matrix, which actually becomes the starting point of most of the analyses that I will be describing in this video. So um, let's have a look at my results. I will actually combine results and additional results here in one um, uh, in one section. Um, so for the most basic results, I'm going to show you this Excel file. Uh, what I did, I took two collections of essays, good and bad. Uh, so here we are. These essays are, I had 29 bad essays and 29 good essays after I threw out the middle. And I created this TF, TFIDF matrix for this entire collection. 
So as you can see in these columns here, I have um, a, a 1,009, no, uh, wait, 1,996 words because it starts with a zero. It's not 3,000 as I mentioned before because I threw out the middle here. So if you only take the collection of bad essays plus the collection of good essays, uh, they use uh, slightly less than uh, 2,000 unique English words in them. And then I built this TF-IDF matrix, so all these uh, numbers that you can see in the cells here are the TF-IDF scores for each of the words in each of the essays, right? What I did then, uh, what, what I did next was I calculated the average TF-IDF score for each word in the bad essays and I calculated the average TF-IDF score for each word in the good essays. And then I just um, rank ordered, I calculated the difference between uh, bad and good and I rank ordered all the words according to the largest difference from the largest to the smallest. Uh, and then I took the first 100 largest values and I cut down the original matrix so that it only shows these 100 words as the original matrix um, in order of decreasing difference of uh, TF-IDF between good essays and bad essays. So this uh, thing here only shows the most different words and what TF-IDF scores uh, the different essays received uh, for these words. Now I repackaged this a little in this um, sheet and it's probably more uh, straightforward to interpret so that's the one I'm gonna uh, go through very quickly. Now the green ones mean that this word had a higher TF-IDF score in good essays and the bad ones, the, the red ones, mean that this word had a higher TF-IDF score in bad essays. Uh, more simply put, uh, if uh, the cell in this column is green, it means that the word is more frequently used in good essays or it's more uniquely characteristic of good essays. And if the color here is red, it means that this particular word is more uniquely characteristic of bad essays. And I listed the, the first hundred words here. So one artifact becomes obvious straight away. Apparently there's an unequal distribution of good and bad essays across essay titles. For example, the fact that the word bias is more frequently used in good essays and the words trust and statistic uh, are more frequently used in bad essays and the word pursuit is more frequently used in good essays. These are all simply connected to the fact that uh, in my sample there happens to be more good essays that selected the title about biases and there happened to be more bad essays that selected the title about trust and statistics. Uh, so I didn't analyze these because that's obviously an artifact. In a cleaner scenario I should be taking essays that are dealing with one prescribed essay title only, but I cannot do that for my pilot project because it will reduce the sample size dramatically. So for now I'm just ignoring all these things because, well yeah, I just know that they are associated with the fact that there were more good essays on bias in my sample and there were more bad essays on trust and statistics in my sample. However, I do think that uh, this actually reflects the overall distribution of grades in the world if you look at them. Uh, now I went through all these words and I tried to highlight the most interesting ones here, the ones that are not uh, linked to different titles, I think. Uh, I think. Um, and I created a separate script to check uh, concordance of terms, which I will show you a bit later. So if we go uh, through these results quickly, you will see that the word history is more uniquely characteristic of good essays. Uh, so good essays mention history more often. It could be linked to the fact that essays that talk about bias more frequently bring up examples from history uh, because they talk about historical perspectives 
as a kind of bias. Uh, accepting I'm dismissing here because it's linked to different titles. Interestingly, uh, good essays bring up ethics more often and talk about politics or something to do with the word political. Bad essays more frequently bring up examples related to law. Um, good essays more frequently mention the word intelligence, or it's more uniquely characteristic of good essays. The word art appears um, more frequently in good essays, and actually, if you look at this more closely, you will see that. Um, so, if I find the word art uh, here in this matrix, you will see that it's mentioned in one, two, three, four of the bad essays and one, two, three, four of the good essays. So, actually, the number of essays that mention the word art is the same. But in good essays, if the word art is mentioned, it's mentioned more frequently than in bad essays. This could suggest to me that in good essays, if students are, given, are giving an example related to art, these examples are more uh, well developed and more thoroughly explained in terms of how exactly the example links to art as an area of knowledge. Bad essays talk more frequently about Gas. It's just linked to some um, examples from chemistry there. And actually, I highlighted the most interesting results here by the exclamation marks in the, in the brackets. So I'm going to focus on these ones. Um, good essays apparently more frequently talk about particles. And I think it's a good catch. So apparently, in good essays, uh, it's more common to encounter complicated examples from physics like quantum mechanics or particle physics. Um, good essays uh, talk more about perspectives, have a more developed discussion of perspectives and bring up the word perspective more frequently. Good essays mention the word quantum more often, that kind of overlaps with the word particle here. So again, some complicated examples from physics and quantum mechanics is what's uniquely characteristic of some good essays. Good essays uh, bring up the word historian more and more frequently. Apparently, they analyze the roles of the role of historians in the production of knowledge about the past. Uh, the word event here, I'm not highlighting it with an exclamation mark because it's probably linked to history, so it's from the same category. Good essays uh, mention the word AOKs more, areas of knowledge, so that probably means that they do more explicit linking uh, of the discussion to various areas of knowledge. They bring up words such as economist and historical more. Again, that's probably linked to the examples and the well-developed uh, examples related to historical perspective. Perspectives. Interestingly, the word reasoning appears to be more uniquely characteristic of good essays. Uh, oops, sorry. Uh, the words economic and reality occur in good essays more frequently. The word artist is also more characteristic of good essays. Again, it, it's linked to explicitly explaining art, uh, where good essays explain uh, examples related to art more thoroughly and more explicitly. The word detrimental appears more frequently in uh, good essays, which suggests to me that good essays um, more frequently have some evaluative position intrinsic in them. The words, uh, and actually um, what, what I found interesting about these results is that in the list of the hundred words that were most different between good and bad essays, for me, the most meaningful words appeared closer to the end of this list. So uh, the word impact, for example, is more frequently used in, is more uniquely characteristic of good essays, and it suggests to me that good essays talk about cause-effect relationships more often. Uh, the word association uh, is only, only ever used in bad essays. It's uh, never ever used in any of the good essays. And when I looked more closely at the essays that use the word association, I realized that these are the essays uh, on the statistics prescribed essay title. And they are the ones that talk about uh, deliberately misleading the population by 
uh, presenting incorrectly uh, constructed graphs or something like that. So they talk about associations that general public may have with um, certain graphs or particular numbers. And this talks about deliberate man manipulation of statistical information, which is a, a very common mistake for uh, students who write the response to the statistics title because the title asks about statistics that may be revealing or concealing. And some students start talking about deliberately uh, concealing the truth by misusing statistics, which is not what TOK is about, right? It's not about people who deliberately deceive. It's about statistics itself that can be intrinsically uh, deceitful. The word premise is more frequently used in good essays, again, which suggests that some TOK terms and some rational analysis is only ever encountered in good essays. Uh, the word Soviet is probably linked to examples from history again, and that's why it's more frequently used to, uh, in good essays. Interestingly, the word education is much more frequently used in bad essays. And again, when I looked more closely at the essays that use the word education, I realized that the emphasis in them is on students learning something in school or in university, uh, which again is quite a frequent mistake for TOK students to make in their TOK essays. TOK is not about um, uh, students who are gaining knowledge when they are going through education. TOK is about bodies of knowledge in general. So, um, in other words, uh, I would say that uh, bad essays have a tendency to talk about personal knowledge a lot more than shared knowledge, and good essays have a tendency to place the focus on shared knowledge, and at least show that they clearly realize the distinction between personal and shared knowledge. The word death appears a lot more frequently in bad essays, which, on closer look, um, suggests that bad essays just brought up more examples related to COVID, especially in response to the statistics title. And that's a very overused example, and many of the examples there were quite trivial. The word lie more frequently occurs in bad essays. That's probably again linked to the idea of intentional misinterpretation or deliberate misuse of statistics in the statistics title. The word shared uh, appears more frequently in good essays. Again, it kind of corroborates what I said before, that bad essays have uh, an emphasis on um, personal knowledge and on knowledge that uh, you as a student get in school or, or in university. And good essays place more emphasis on bodies of shared knowledge and they analyze how knowledge itself organizes in these shared areas of knowledge, uh, or rather areas of shared knowledge um, is organized. And these ones, as I said, um, a lot more insightful terms appear closer to the end of the list, so I put a lot of exclamation marks here. The word psychology is more frequently used in bad essays, and again on closer look that suggests to me that um, these are the students who make the common mistake of uh, confusing between psychology and TOK. And they are discussing subject-specific examples or subject-specific theories from psychology, but they don't turn it into a property OK discussion about knowledge. Uh, these words appear more frequently and are more uniquely characteristic of um, good essays. Truth, inductive, absolute, useful, objective, culture, reflective, assumption, researcher. Uh, oh, oh no, sorry, researcher appears more frequently in bad essays. So reflective, culture, objective, useful, absolute, inductive, truth. So these are all uh, TOK concepts, right, and TOK terms. And these are all the indicators that the student has done a good job linking their discussion to the TOK concepts. Uh, the word researcher uh, appears more frequently in bad essays. And on closer look, uh, I realized that this is because some essays discuss the mistakes especially in, uh, in, the t in the essays responding to the bias title. These are the essays that talk about uh, bias, uh, 
they talk about mistakes made by individual researchers. So this or that researcher was, uh, was conducting a, a study and then they decided to deliberately falsify their data or they deliberately introduced the mistake of some sort. So they talk about the biases introduced by particular individual researchers and that's a lot weaker example than talking about biases intrinsic in a particular area of knowledge, uh, irrespective of... Um, so what I'm trying to say is bad essays talked about bad researchers and good essays talked about the intrinsic limitations in this or that area of knowledge and there's a profound difference between the two. So that to me is a really interesting example. Uh, the word simplification and prediction is more frequently used in good essays. These are again uh, TOK concepts. The word child is more frequent, more frequently comes up in bad essays. I think it overlaps with um, what I said previously about education. So bad essays talk more about personal knowledge that you acquire as a child who is growing up or as a student who is going through the process of education. The word audience appears more frequently in bad essays. It again links to what I said before, uh, especially in statistics titles, that they talk a lot more about impressions produced on the audience and how the what associations the general public had with particular statistical results. And it takes the focus off uh, the intrinsic limitations of, of statistics itself. The word standard and methodology, these words are more frequently used in good essays, again, TOK terms. Um, implication is a TOK term that is more frequently used in good essays. Personal, uh, which again relates to the, to the distinction between personal and shared knowledge. As you saw, the word shared is also more uniquely characteristic of good essays. I mentioned it before, yeah, here it is. So good essays, um, draw a more explicit distinction between shared knowledge and personal knowledge and they discuss them separately uh, with the focus on shared knowledge whereas uh, bad essays do not draw a um, an explicit distinction between personal and shared knowledge and their focus is on personal knowledge in the discussion um, yeah i think i went through the main results here well, yeah, and some some uh, interesting an interesting result here is uh, the word perhaps, which is more frequent frequently used in uh, good essays. I don't think I have to explain it. It's probably an indicator of uh, of the ability of the student to come up with some explanations, some alternative explanations, and at the same time, the ability of the student to be uh, well sufficiently critical of their own um, conclusions. The word black is more frequently used in good essays as well. Uh, on closer analysis, it, it appears in such combinations as black hole, black swan, and black American. So it's not only, um, it's, it's a polysemantic word, right? Uh, just to quickly show you some, uh, some other types of analyses I, I did to uh, kind of deepen my understanding of the words and combinations of words that are more uniquely characteristic of good and bad essays. Um, there's, a, there's a short script I wrote to do concordance. Uh, so concordance is simply the words uh, that uh, are in, in, in the immediate neighborhood uh, around the word that interests you. So this script that I've written here, it just splits all the essays into good and bad. As you can see here, I, I do the cutoff points. Then it does the simple uh, pre-processing. Uh, lemmatization and uh, removes all the special characters and stuff like that and then it does the concordance so for example um, recently I mentioned the word particle that appears a lot more frequently in uh, good essays so I want to know in what uh, contexts the word particle is usually used in good essays uh, let me try finding out so I will type good essays and part Particle. Uh, I will uh, run the script. Just give it a second because it needs to uh, activate, and hopefully it will show me the um, the context in which the word particle appears in uh, in good and bad in in good essays. 
So that's the context. So this basically just uh, lists all the instances of the word particle and all the good essays that I have in my sample. And it shows the words immediately preceding the word particle in these instances and immediately following it. And by examination of these words, I see um, in which um, context the word particle is usually used. And that's how I understand that um, the word particle in good essays is very frequently used in response to the label title because it appears very frequently in combination with um, the word label or some related words, which suggests to me that um, labeling of an electron is a particle, blah, blah, blah. So when I looked closely at these essays, I also realized that in response to the label title, um, it's only the good essays that give these uh, sophisticated examples, usually from uh, particle physics, where particles are labeled a certain way on the basis of certain assumptions, whereas bad essays usually give um, more superficial examples, such as musical genres or something like that. Or suppose, let's look at, uh, we saw that the word reality is more frequently used in good essays. So I will type reality here and I will run the script. Uh, yeah, all the instances of the word reality in my sample of good essays are here. Concealed, the reality of living in blah, 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 prediction, in fact, becomes reality, reality Galileo. So you can see that there's uh, a variety of examples links, linked to the, concept, to the concept of reality. Um, let's just do like one or two more. So the word personal is more frequently used in good essays. And I claimed that this is probably because uh, it has to do with personal knowledge and shared knowledge. So let, let me check if my assumption is right. And it seems to be right, yeah, because it's personal knowledge, personal knowledge, personal knowledge, personal beliefs, personal knowledge, personal belief, personal bias, personal knowledge. So after examining all these concordances, I can claim that um, it is because of the distinction between personal and shared knowledge that the words personal and shared and the, and the more explicit recognition of the difference uh, because personal and shared knowledge appear more frequently in good essays. Uh, so um, this is uh, an overview of the, uh, of the first 100 words that appear to be the most uniquely different between good essays and uh, bad essays. So coming back, in a nutshell, these are the top words that I identify as more uniquely characteristic of good essays after I have excluded everything that uh, is probably linked to the artifacts, such as uh, some titles um, gaining higher marks than some other titles. So in good essays, uh, the top words that I have identified are intelligence, art, particle, perspective, historian, faith, quantum, event, AOKs, economist, reasoning, economic reality, artist, detrimental impact, premise, shared, personal, truth, inductive, absolute, useful, objective, culture, reflective, simplification, prediction, standard, methodology, implication, and interestingly, perhaps, in bad essays, the top ones are law, association, education, death, lie, psychology, research, a child, audience, clear and proven. Uh, bad essays more frequently claim that something is clear. It's clear from this example that, and bad essays use the word prove a lot more frequently, which suggests that uh, these students are not entirely aware of the limitations implicit in some areas of knowledge. And um, a, a lot of words in bad essays are also words repeated from the prescribed title. That's another thing that bad essays tend to do. Uh, there are fewer words in the bad essays list. Uh, that's probably because bad essays are not so sophisticated in the first place, and there is not so much knowledge-related vocabulary beyond the words already used in the title. The list also suggests that bad essays are often more categorical. Like look at words like clear and proven, for example. Uh, that bad essays are more often focused on the perception of knowledge in society rather than knowledge itself. For
for example, the words such as audience or why. Uh, on the activities of individual researchers and examples related to personal knowledge, researcher, for example, uh, or like education. And um, child, also here. And it also looks like bad essays are more likely to make the mistake of confusing examples related to psychology and examples related to, to UK. So um, I'm happy to report at this point that uh, a lot of these words are very thoroughly covered in our book, the TOK textbook for the new syllabus. Please check it out. And I'm also happy that um, some of these typical mistakes that I uh, seem to have identified here have been covered in some of my previous videos. For example, uh, check out the video discussing the differences between psychology and TOK and explaining when psychology-related examples work well in TOK essays and when they do not. And let me just quickly show you the additional analysis as well. Uh, as I said, this was the corpus, the entire corpus of essays that I looked at, but I also conducted a similar analysis with each of the essay titles separately. I'm not going through all of them here, but I will just quickly show you um, what I've done. Results are based on a much smaller sample of essays. Um, however, there's uh, a quick look at the differences in TF-IDF scores between good and bad essays in the statistics title. And uh, the, the title is about statistics and whether or not it conceals more information than it reveals. And you can see, I will just uh, slowly scroll down here. So the green ones are the words that are more frequently um, used in uh, good essays. And the, um, what color is that? reddish, orange, whatever. This color is uh, the words that are more uniquely characteristic uh, of bad essays. And uh, it appears that in the statistics title, bad essays talk more often about intentional deceit and deliberately manipulating statistical information. And also they give a lot of examples about COVID, while good essays appear to be more focused on the analysis of statistics itself and how mathematical calculations themselves may be concealing or revealing. But I'm not going too deeply into this because this kind of analysis is based on a very limited sample of essays, so I need a bigger sample to make more meaningful conclusions here. All right, done with this part. Okay, allow me to go over to the next step, LDA. Uh, and topic mining. LDA stands for Latent Dirichlet Allocation. I totally mispronounced this term before, uh, for which please accept my apologies. So I'll start with some technical details and then uh, I will walk you through the results. And finally, I will try to uh, summarize the key findings from, from this part of analysis. Um, the logic behind LDA latent Dirichlet allocation is that we assume that each document consists of several topics, like I have tried to show here, and each topic consists of a bunch of words that frequently occur together. We have no idea what these topics are and what these topics are comprised of, so we want the computer to find out. Uh, latent Dirichlet allocation is called latent because we can't uh, observe the topics directly. We just assume that these topics exist and they cause certain words to frequently occur together. Like, uh, because words 71 and 12, 15 and 2902 belong to the same topic, that's probably why these words frequently occur together. Uh, there's a sophisticated machine learning algorithm that finds an optimal allocation of words to topics and topics to documents. And this allocation has to explain as accurately as possible why certain words occur where they do. Essentially, LDA is a type of unsupervised classification technique, meaning that we want to classify texts into groups, but we don't know what these groups are. I know it sounds complicated and it's not the purpose of this video to explain. If you want to know more, there's a... Um, 
great explanation here at Arun Sharma's article on the Great Learning blog. Um, it's called Understanding Latent Dirichlet Allocation. And uh, he gives some uh, visual explanations as well. This is how documents are split into topics, and each topic consists of a certain distribution of words. And he explains what happens numerically uh, when you build a matrix of all the topics versus all the words appearing in all the documents. And then you try to allocate words to topics uh, in such a way that the interpretability is maximized. So if you're interested to know the technical characteristics of latent Dirichlet allocation, uh, please have a look at this article. I need to mention that machine learning techniques like this one require a lot of data to be reliable. And I only have a very limited sample of 109 essays. So ideally, I should have thousands for this to work meaningfully. But to make the most of the situation, I tried three different approaches to what I consider a document. Uh, an essay, a paragraph, and a sentence. In the first approach, I have 109 essays. In the second approach, I automatically split all, all those essays into 1,478 paragraphs. And in the third approach, I split them all into 7,038 sentences. I tried all three approaches, but for the purposes of this particular video, I will be using the second approach where I consider uh, documents uh, to be uh, paragraphs. The first approach is probably better, but 109 documents is not enough for a meaningful LDA. The third approach does not work, actually, because in TOK essays, one thought or one topic is typically spread across several sentences. So it would be incorrect to assume that topics are successfully confined to individual sentences. And my results when I did that uh, reflected this. So what I'm analyzing here is a collection of 1,478 paragraphs. And I assume that a paragraph typically talks about one or several topics. When the LDA model is built, you can assess its quality by using a metric called coherence score. The coherence score is large when words can be unambiguously assigned to topics and topics can be unambiguously assigned to documents without much unexplained overlap. And the coherence score is small when the topics are not coherent. That is, Sometimes words belonging to a topic appear in contexts that are not supposed to be associated with that topic. There are no specific guidelines on what counts as a large or a small coherence score, but obviously you want to choose a model that gives you the best coherence score in your circumstances. So what I did was I tried fitting a whole series of LDA models, starting with two topics and ending with 25 topics, and I computed the coherence score for each of these models, and then I chose the optimal number of topics based on that. So this graph in particular shows me that for the whole corpus, uh, the good number of topics to look at would be four, because it gives you a coherence score of 0.41, which is decent, and 10, which gives you a coherence score of 0.44, which is even more decent. So obviously, 10 topics is a lot of topics to interpret, so I looked at four topics in the entire in the entire corpus. But I will also show you a model that looks at uh, ten topics. I did not uh, go deeply into the model that builds fifteen topics because there's a larger number of topics, but a very mini very um, minuscule increase in the coherence score, which means it's not. It's not worth it. You, you can't just add five more topics uh, for the increase of a, of a fraction of this score. Um, to show you the script, it's quite long and complicated. It put me a lot of time to put together, so I'll just uh, quickly scroll through it. If someone is interested, I can make a separate video on how this is all accomplished in Python. So these are the parameters that I'm changing here. I vary the number of topics. I um, 
varied the corpus. So I looked at the entire corpus and only good essays, only bad essays, then separately all the titles, separately bad essays in each of the titles, separately good essays in each of the titles. Uh, I'm reading uh, file names from an Excel sheet. Then I'm doing the pre-processing and I'm saving the the uh, the uh, essays, the paragraphs into new files. I'm breaking them down into individual paragraphs. Um, then I do the pre-processing, removing stop words, identifying all the bygrounds, doing lemmatization, preparing for latent Dirich allocation, uh, Dirichlet allocation. I was using GenSim, which is a package in Python. Uh, this is where I compute the coherence scores. This is where I uh, create a graphical representation of topics that, that I'm about to show you. This is where I'm finding the optimal number of topics for LDA and generate that graph that I have just shown you. And this is where I print uh, different sorts of matrices for further analysis and more in-depth understanding of what has happened. Um, so I ran the analysis for the entire corpus, all essays combined, but also separately for essays written on each of the six prescribed titles and separately on good essays and bad essays. Obviously, the fewer essays there are in the analysis, the less reliable the model, but I wanted to visualize uh, topics as much as possible um, nevertheless. So let's go over to the results. And for the results, I will show you uh, these uh, four groups. I will show you the results of LDA for the whole corpus with four topics, then results of LDA for the whole corpus with 10 topics. The reason I chose four and 10 is this graph here to maximize the coherence score. And then I will show you uh, LDA, the LDA model for good essays separately and the LDA model for bad essays separately. So let's look at the whole corpus with four topics and I will show you the, um, the visualization for that. So it's an essay classifier, output, all LDA visualization with four topics. It's a really cool visualization um, created by, what are the names of these guys? Uh, I think it's, uh, it's these guys, Siebert and Shirley, and they have a paper here. Um, yeah, I need to I need to give credits to the heroes. Uh, so uh, yeah, I think it's these guys, uh, Carson Siebert and Kenneth Shirley, they created a very cool method of visualizing results of latent Dirichlet allocation. So what this graph shows you is um, the four topics that I identified, and it places the topics in a two-dimensional uh, space, depending on how semantically close the topics are to each other. So as you can see, the model here identified uh, four topics. Topics one and two overlap quite a lot. Topic one explains 46% uh, of all the tokens used in, in, all, the, uh, in all the essays. And topic two explains 20, approximately 27% of all words. And there's topic three and topic four. So the larger the circle, the more prevalent the topic is in the whole collection of essays. It just means that uh, the more frequently essays, or in my case, paragraphs, uh, mention words associated with that particular topic. So that's one, two, three, four. Now to understand what the topic itself is about, you look at the words that are more most characteristic of that particular topic because a topic is nothing else but a combination of uh, words that frequently occur together. So to understand what topic one is about here, you look at the words that comprise this topic and it kind of starts making sense to you. Now there's the gray bar and the red bar. The gray bar represents the frequency with which the word is used in the entire collection of uh, essays. So it's the overall frequency with which the word is used. And the superimposed red bar 
is the estimated frequency with which this word is used in this particular topic. So the frequency with this this word with which this word is uh, comes up when this particular topic is being discussed. So if you look at the word label, for example, um, most of the cases of the usage of the word label in my corpus of essays is associated with the hypothetical topic one where this word is being discussed and the topic is nothing else but a context so think about a topic as other words surrounding the word label so the word label is most frequently except for this tiny bit here met in combination with such words as knowledge use understand natural science mathematics however history area of knowledge and so on you can also adjust this slide here that kind of changes the way um, the top words are selected for each topic so if you choose one it will just give you the most frequent words mentioned in a particular topic so it ranges all the words according to the red bar only so knowledge label use understand if you choose zero here I think I think it um, as the top matches. It gives you the words that have the mo the largest red to gray ratio. So it gives you the words that are used in this topic only, and nowhere else, right? And then what's another cool thing about this visualization is that you can highlight individual words, and you can see which topics these words are associated with. So the word understand is only ever used in the first topic. The word mathematic and area of knowledge and system is only ever used in the first topic. Uh, the words such as knowledge is mostly used in the first topic, but it also appears in topic two and to some extent in topic three. The word label is used in topic four a lot, but it's also associated with topic uh, one and so on and so forth. The creators of this visualization experimented with this metric and they claim that 0.6 uh, usually gives the most interpretable uh, outcome. So interpreting the, uh, looking at the combination of words in each topic and trying to interpret what the topics are about, this is what uh, I understand. The first topic is, is the general topic about knowledge and areas of knowledge because it's comprised of such terms as knowledge, understand and understanding areas of knowledge um, human sciences natural sciences history mathematics but also it includes such words as label and language where's language you saw it somewhere yeah it's here uh, it's bottom of the list but it's only ever used in the first topic so um Combination of areas of knowledge, uh, combination of areas of knowledge is also entirely here. Where is the combination? Uh, yeah, combine areas of knowledge, uh, areas of knowledge again, most useful in the, the title says most useful in combination. So this topic talks about areas of knowledge and combinations of areas of knowledge and the overall concepts of knowledge and understanding, uh, but also brings up labels and language to some extent. And as I said, 46% of paragraphs contain this topic in this or that way. So it's the we can say that it's the generic, most basic topic about knowledge. Now, topic two, if you look at the words that comprise this topic, uh, it quickly becomes evident that this topic is about bias and trust. And there was an, a prescribed essay title about bias, and there was a prescribed essay title about trust. Also, you can see accepting knowledge claims here. Claim, accept, and um, such words as theory, faith, and faith is here, and confirmation bias. What did I see? Confirmation bias. Yeah, here, confirmation bias is only ever used in this topic. So uh, that's, the, that's the second topic, right? It's about bias, trust, uh, also change in progress, 
and also theory, faith, and confirmation bias. And these two topics overlap because, well, they discuss the general limitations of knowledge. The third topic, which is more distinctly different from the others, is about statistics. Statistics reveal, conceal, uh, also such things as country, economy, manipulate, government, food, mislead, model, which I, I suppose is a statistical model. Also such words as information, model, and cause. So clearly this is about, uh, that's the statistics title, right? And the fourth topic is, again, quite clearly examples of labels, uh, such as art, music, periodic table, uh, taxonomies of organisms and animals, uh, uh, species, genres, rock music, styles, taxonomy is here. And as, as we saw before, the word, um, the word label also appears frequently in this topic. Here it is. It overlaps with the first topic, but it also frequently appears in this one as well. So if we look at all these four topics in combination, it kind of becomes evident that topic number three, which is more distinctly different from the rest of the topics, is the statistics title. Topic number four is the uh, label title and all different examples linked to the concept of labels and topic number one and two are the general discussions about limitations of knowledge uh, with more focus on areas of knowledge and comparing them in the first topic and more focus on the ideas of bias and trust in the second topic Overall, it's a kind of it's a really good way to visualize the topics and get a sense of what people write about in general. Um, I will also show you. Um, uh, yeah, wait a second. Um, I'll also show you the topic matrix with four topics. Oh, I don't need this anymore. So with topic matrix, this is what's happening. Uh, the rows here are all my individual paragraphs that I have um, separated. And in the columns here are the four topics that I have singled out in this four topic LDA model. And these are the scores that each of the paragraphs gets for each of the topics. Uh, so it does mean that one paragraph does not belong exclusively to one topic. In one paragraph, one paragraph usually contains a combination of words that are associated with uh, uh, different topics, but it's usually the case that one topic is predominant. For example, here in paragraph number 13, uh, topic two is predominant. And if you look at the key words from this paragraph, you will understand why. Confirm, hypothesis, cite, study, indicate, result, study, confirm, hypothesis, bias, uh, scientific community, dangerous, informed future research. So it's about it's about bias and and trusting results of of of, of a particular study, right? But it also has a component of uh, of topic number one, which is the generic characteristics of knowledge. So these are the matrices that I also looked at. Uh, no, we don't need this anymore. Now. Um, let me show you the same model, but with uh, 10 topics. Oops, it's the wrong file. 10 topics. So when I did the same visualization, but with 10 topics, so I selected this number of topics because it maximizes the coherence score a little. This is what we get. Again, there's topic one and two that are largely overlapping. I will use 0.6 for better uh, visual. It just picks up some specific topics, uh, some tiny specific topics that are not mentioned in a large number of paragraphs. Uh, but these topics are quite clearly cut sometimes, such as a discussion of models in economics or the pandemic. Nothing too special. I'm just showing it to you as an example of what you can get if you ask for a larger number of topics. It, kind of becomes more fine-tuned, but the logic stays the same. One and two, big overlapping topics. One topic that stands aside, 
one other topic that stands aside, and a whole bunch of tiny topics that are mentioned in a small number of paragraphs that usually deal with some particular examples. For example, let's look at topic number eight. Yeah, this one. Um, and it has such words as music, sugar, content, song, uh, coronary, as in coronary disease. Uh, there's also something about uh, uh, accepting knowledge claims, accepting knowledge, and something about statistics concealing. Where did I see that? Oh, yeah, it's a pretty... Yeah. Yeah, and these words, statistics concealing, are also here. So they are also free... The word statistics concealing are also frequently used in topic number one, but uh, the the only other topic that uses these words frequently is topic number eight. So topic number eight is an interesting combination of statistics conceal something and words such as music, sugar, content, song, coronary, and so on. So I was curious to see what it looks like in a particular paragraph and using the uh, the the uh, topic matrix, I found an example of a document where uh, this topic is predominant. It's document 45, and I will show you the document. So document 45 is this paragraph. And if you read through this, you will understand that, indeed, this is an example that illustrates the statistics conceal point, but the example itself is linked to sugar consumption and heart disease. So um, it shows you how um, the LDA model with these visualizations, it's actually pretty good at uh, picking out what exactly is being discussed in an individual paragraph. So as you have seen, this, this, this document is a combination of topic number one, which is the, uh, which is the statistics, which is associated with statistics and concealing, and topic number eight, which is associated with um, um, with with uh, things like uh, atherosclerosis and fat consumption. So it shows you pretty well um, which examples are used in combination with with which uh, themes or topics. For another document that I found interesting, so I'll actually show you the document matrix. So that's the document matrix for 10 topics, right? And one document that I just showed you is document 45, document number 45. So it had a combination of uh, topic one, LDA one, and topic eight, LDA eight. So these are the two topics that weigh a lot for, for this document. And as we've seen, that's knowledge and statistics and conceding something and these specific examples about uh, uh, fat consumption and atherosclerosis. And now just one more example to illustrate uh, how easy it is to interpret these results is document 1238. I don't remember why I picked this one, but let's see. So document 1238 is a combination of topic eight, LDA8 and topic one, LDA1. Yeah. So document 1238 is this document. And if you read through it, you will see that it's a very concrete example about music and labels, uh, conceptual uh, and labels as musical genres, but it's also linked to uh, the idea of misleading. Uh, so once again, uh, if my LDA model picks up a combination of topics in a particular paragraph, it's because the paragraph actually discusses these two topics. So it's a paragraph about music that's linked to the idea of uh, misleading information. Now, I also promised uh, to show you good essays separately and bad essays separately, which is what I'm going to do. 
So in good assays, my LDA visualization is this. I actually selected a lot of um, uh, topics here because the coherence score graph suggested that a lot of topics have to be selected. And not going into a, a lot of details here, I will just say that uh, trust, which is topic four, in good essays is more distinctly uh, separate from other topics. It was not the same in other essays, but in good essays it appears to be the case. <clears throat> in topic three, there's a clear group of examples about hypothesis testing or collecting data and various factors affecting human behavior. Topic five in this model is a more distinct topic about the usefulness of combination of areas of knowledge, useful combination area of knowledge. Uh, topic six is obviously a link between the idea of labels. Here it is, labels, and the idea of particles, particles and species, actually. And the tiny topics here, topics seven and further, are small, but they're more clearly interpretable small topics. So if I just show you a sample paragraph for topic three, which is about the variables, data collecting hypotheses, that's document 61, this one. I'm not going to read through it, but if you do, you will see that this topic is an explanation of the complexity of human sciences. So it can suggest that good essays explain what makes human sciences complex beyond just stating that human sciences are more subjective, which is what bad essays commonly do. And for topic six, which is a combination of labels and particles and stuff like that, uh, a representative document is document number 39. I will just show it to you. And again, I'm not reading through it, but if you do, you will see that in good essays, examples for labels are more frequently linked to stuff from uh, natural sciences, such as particles in particle physics. Let me now look at similar examples from bad essays. Uh, LDA visualization. And you will immediately see that if you compare good essays to bad essays, you will see that the model is much cleaner and the topics are more clearly distinct from each other. If you look at the words that compose the topics, you will see that topic one is about statistics and bias. Topic two is about an element of trust in accepting knowledge claims. Knowledge claim, um, trust. Trust is only used in this topic. Topic three is about combination of, of uh, areas of knowledge. Combination, areas of knowledge, natural sciences, two areas of knowledge. Uh, Topic four is about labels, very clearly about labels. Topic five is, where is it? Yeah, it's something about mathematics, but it's close to topic three, which is a combination of areas of knowledge. So it's probably related to that. Topic six is about Religion, vaccination, elections. I suppose these are just the frequently used and overused examples. And topic seven and eight contain more overused examples, such as about consumers, markets, and climate change. So interestingly, if you compare good essays to bad essays, good essays appear to be more cognitively complex. There's more overlap. It can be due to a different distribution of essay titles, of course, but it can also be due to the fact that in a single paragraph, good essays both describe an example 
and explained what concepts this example relates to and how exactly. I'm not showing you the results for different prescribed essays that I say titled separately. Uh, there are some interesting results there actually, and I may probably just summarize my main conclusions in one of my next videos, but let me go over to the summary of this part of results here. I understand that uh, this was all a bit uh, overwhelming and there were actually lots of results there. It's not always clear how to interpret them, so I'll try to formulate some key takeaway messages at this point. My first key takeaway message is that even with a very limited sample of TOK essays, the LDA model, latent Dirichlet allocation, was quite successful in automatically identifying the common themes. It kind of discovered the prescribed essay titles without knowing these titles beforehand, which is pretty amazing. I'm sure that with a larger sample and with some better pre-processing, the model can become even more coherent, and I will keep working on it. My second big takeaway message is that some prescribed essay titles naturally overlap, in that students talked about similar things in response to these titles. The one about statistics and the one about labels, for example, stand more clearly apart from the rest, but the one about bias and the one about trust seem to have a lot of common, a lot in common, so they're not so easily distinguished. My third big takeaway is that it looks like one major difference between good and bad TOK essays is that in bad essays, examples are not so well linked to the concepts. As you have seen from the visualizations, topics in good essays are more overlapping and topics in bad essays are more distinctly separate from each other. A good essay will describe an example and then at the end of the same paragraph, provide a comprehensive explanation of how this example relates to the knowledge concepts that are being discussed. That's why the model automatically picks up a combination of two topics in this paragraph. For example, medicine and uh, 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 how do you pronounce that? Medicine and uh, fat consumption, but also statistics and concealing information, for example. By contrast, in bad essays, it looks like a typical paragraph will just describe an example, and then at the very best, the title will be restated at the end. So the link is either not made at all, or it's just postulated but not developed. My fourth big takeaway is that bad essays are more similar to each other in terms of examples that they use. These are mostly trivial overused examples, such as COVID in essays about statistics, anti vaxxers. Donald Trump, Flat Earth, and so on. By contrast, good essays use more sophisticated and complicated examples, such as particle physics in response to the questions about labels. And uh, one thing that my model has not managed to identify is that a very important difference that explains the OK marks is first order versus second order discussion. Good essays are about knowledge and bad essays are about the world. Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about here, please watch my series, Typical Mistakes in TOK Essays, or read my book. So, this difference is not really picked up automatically yet, and I don't know yet how to teach my model to recognize a second-order discussion and to tell it apart from a first-order discussion, but I will keep working on it. So, uh, this concludes part three, and the next part is going to be the exciting part four where I'm trying to teach my algorithm to read and okay. mark TOK essays automatically. Okay, over to the last part, the, uh, automatic essay scoring. In the previous part I used an algorithm to automatically extract topics from texts. I didn't tell the computer that there were six prescribed essay titles, but it nevertheless did a decent job discovering these titles by itself. We could also see some difference between good and bad TOK essays in terms of what examples are used, how they are connected to knowledge concepts, and so on. In machine learning terminology, this was all a case of unsupervised learning. 
But I'm also interested in knowing how successful an algorithm can be in marking TOK essays. I will simplify the task to just telling the difference between a good TOK essay, by which I mean level 7 or above, and a bad TOK essay, by which I mean level 6 and below. So can a computer algorithm cope with the task as well as human examiners do? Again, uh, my collection of essays is extremely small for this task, but one thing is better than nothing. So I can at least try and see what happens. I will walk you through the technical details of this part of the project first, then speak about the results and the additional results and try to formulate some summary message. Let me start with some technical details. Uh, the task that I'm facing is known as a supervised classification task. I have a bunch of essays and they have been marked by IB examiners. Uh, I will only take bad essays and good essays and throw out the ones in the middle. Uh, I will further split my essays into the training set and the test set. With the training set I will give it to my algorithm and say, look, these are the essays and these are the marks they got from the IB. Can you try and figure out which characteristics of these essays explain the marks that they have been given. My algorithm will, will do the usual pre-processing, such as removal of stop words, lemmatization, and so on, and then it will try to find combinations of words that can potentially explain the marks. After my algorithm thinks it has figured it out, I will feed it the test set of essays without revealing the marks. The algorithm will then apply the rules that it has discovered to this new set of essays. It will predict the marks, and I will compare these predictions to the actual marks from IB, and so I will be able to calculate how accurate the predictions were. That's the common logic of supervised machine learning in general, and in fact, any artificial intelligence system follows exactly this logic. There are many ways to train an algorithm, and I will certainly try more sophisticated ones in the future, but today I will be using the so-called random forest classifier. Explaining what random forest classifier is is beyond the scope of this video, uh, but you can always look it up online in case you want to know more. Let me just explain the following key points that may be important for this particular project. Uh, the for random forest classifier algorithm doesn't care about the sequence of words. Um, from the point of view of this, al uh, of this algorithm, uh, Alexei chased a cow around the field, and the cow chased Alexei around the field are the same sentences, because the algorithm only looks at which words occur in which documents, but it doesn't care about where in the document the words occur and in what sequence. There are more sophisticated neural network techniques out there that do take the sequence into account, but I'm leaving that for later. The algorithm also has its own internal set of rules that are very complex, so they can't be easily visualized. It's a bit of a black box. We feed the essays into the model, something happens inside the black box, and then the black box spits out the prediction. We actually know what's happening there, but we cannot visualize it in a set of simple rules. In other words, I cannot say which combinations of words exactly were used to predict the mark in which context. It's a complicated set of rules. I can, however, tell you which words were most important in, determine, in determining the decisions of the algorithm overall. Again, this is how all machine learning works. It's all a bit of a black box. Um, I only have 29 good essays and 29 bad essays, which is nowhere near sufficient for machine learning algorithms, so I used paragraphs as my input instead. I know it's a stretch because it's the essay that is being marked and not the paragraph, but I just assumed that um, all paragraphs in a bad essay are bad, and all paragraphs in a good essay are good. Once I have more essays in my database, I will surely be able to build a more sophisticated model using actual essays as an input. Now, without further ado, let me quickly show you the script. Um, so, 
it's quite long, but I will just um, briefly walk you through it. So first you import all the necessary libraries. You read the uh, Excel sheet that contains information about each of the essays, who wrote it, what mark it received, and the name of the file containing the full text of the essay. I have programmed the script to deal with uh, three types of analysis, uh, essay, paragraph, and sentence depending on what I consider to be a document. I have tried all these three, that's why I have pre-programmed this uh, variable analysis type here. But I will only show you the one with the paragraphs because it is the best option, uh, both from the common sense point of view and, well, it, it got the best results. Then I'm deciding which scores to use as cutoff points. Uh, for good essays and bad essays. As I said before, uh, in the common scenario, I was using essays that got more than six, that is seven or above, as good essays. And I was using essays that got less than five, that is four or below, as bad essays. So uh, I can have two groups of essays of approximately equal size, and I'm throwing, throwing out the middle to see the difference more clearly. But I could have used a different cutoff, and as a matter of fact, uh, I will show you in the additional results that I changed the cutoff points here to just draw the line between level 5 and level 6, and I was able to repeat the whole analysis um, in that scenario. Uh, the parameter search, parameter search value is for whether or not I want to build multiple models with slightly different technical parameters to fine-tune the parameters. I've done this multiple times when I was experimenting with different models, but I'm switching it off for now because there are all these old technical details. What I do next here is I split all essays into good ones and bad ones, depending on the cutoffs that I determined above. Then I do some pre-processing to clean up the texts before I can split them into paragraphs such as removing odd and unnecessary line breaks and special symbols and so on. And I split the essays into a list of paragraphs. Uh, I assume that all paragraphs in, a good, in good essays are good and all paragraphs in a bad essay are bad. This is because I don't have enough essays. Once I do, it will be more meaningful to treat one document as one full essay. I'm saving all my paragraphs into... Um, separate text files and in placing them in two folders, the, um, the good folder and the bad folder. Um, then there's a function to, um, yeah, so this is where I save it into folders. I'm, I'm skipping these parts because these are for the scenario when I'm using sentences and this is for the scenario when I'm using full essays. So I'm saving them into folders here. Then there's a bit of a function to lemmatize all words. Uh, for example, went, will go, have gone, will be going, are all turned into the same word go, the basic form. And I'm removing all words that are not nouns or verbs or adjectives or adverbs. Finally, I'm using um, the libraries NLTK and sklearn in Python to um, build the machine learning model, in my case, a random forest classifier. Uh, the name of the function here is neural networks, which is a bit confusing, uh, but because I started experimenting with neural networks first, it, it should actually say something like build a random forest classifier instead. Here I'm importing the text from the files. Um, that I saved previously. Uh, I do some additional pre-processing again, uh, just in case. I think this is probably a duplication and can be removed, I'm not sure. Then I'm lemmatizing all documents, then I'm using a count vectorizer um, to turn all my documents into a matrix, where in the rows I have the paragraphs, and in the columns I have all possible words that are used in TOK essays. So for the paragraph scenario, at this point, I have 787 rows or 787 paragraphs, and I have 2,000 columns uh, for 2,000 most frequently occurring words. And in the cells for count vectorizer, I have simple counts, which means how many words this particular word has been used in this paragraph. 
and then I convert this matrix into a TFIDF matrix, term frequency inverse document frequency, which replaces the simple counts in the cells with the TFIDF metric. And that's what is actually used to predict the mark. I will show you this resulting matrix in a bit. Now I'm sp splitting the sample into, um, this is where I'm just gluing together some, uh, uh, some um, matrices with results. Then I'm splitting the sample into the test into the training set and the testing set. I'm choosing here to set aside 20% of the paragraphs as a testing set, which is common practice, but again I could have used a different percentage here. Then I'm building a random uh, forest classifier to fit um, into the training set. I ask my algorithm to provide importances, uh, which is the list of words that appear to be the most crucial in the decisions made by the algorithm. And this piece of code here is where I'm playing, playing with some technical parameters, trying to define the most um, appropriate ones. And finally, I ask my model to predict the, um, the marks for all the essays in the test set. These are the 20% of the essays whose marks my computer doesn't know. And I print the results. Uh, I also have some of the results, I also save some of the results into Excel files for further analysis. And I'm printing the confusion matrix classification report and accuracy score here. When I hit the run button for this script, it actually takes my Mac about 10 or 11 minutes to complete. So I have done it already and I have copied the main results on a slide to show you what it has all led to. Um, let me go over to the results. So this is what it comes down to. When I analyze 402 bad paragraphs versus 385 good paragraphs, the resulting accuracy of classification, good versus bad, is 78%. This is what the output looks like in Python, but I made it more human readable here on the slide. This means that my algorithm correctly places an unseen TOK essay into the bad or good category 78% of the time. It's not too bad. Uh, to look at this result more closely, we can look at the... Um, at this matrix, which is called the confusion matrix. Uh, so there were 158 unseen paragraphs overall. Out of 85 paragraphs that were actually bad, that is, that got, uh, that come from essays that received four or below from AB examiners, 71%, uh, 71 of these paragraphs were classified correctly as bad, which means that. Um, 84% of bad paragraphs were classified correctly. Out of 73 paragraphs that were actually good, 52 paragraphs were correctly classified as good, and that's 71% of good paragraphs that are classified correctly. So the algorithm does a very decent job recognizing a bad paragraph when it sees one, but it sometimes incorrectly classifies good paragraphs as bad ones. Uh, although 71% is a decent result too, given that all, given all the limitations of my project, such as small sample size, using paragraphs instead of essays, and so on. We can also look at it this way. Out of 92 paragraphs that my algorithm considered to be bad, 71 were actually bad. And that's 77% of all paragraphs classified as bad are actually bad. On the other hand, out of 67, 66 paragraphs that my algorithm considered to be coming from good essays, 52 of these paragraphs were actually came from good essays, and that's 79%. Uh, out of all paragraphs classified as good, 79% were actually good. So if my algorithm considers an essay to be good, to be bad, it is actually bad with a 77% probability. And if my algorithm considers an essay to be good, it's actually good with a 79% probability. I'm quite satisfied with this result for now. 78% overall accuracy 
is very decent and with a larger sample and a better model I'm sure this can be improved even further. I also want to compare that with the accuracy of human marking. Uh, in other words, when teachers predict what marks an essay will receive from the IB, do they do a better job than my simple algorithm? Or uh, do they, do they uh, have an accuracy about that much as well? Before I do that, uh, let me show you some additional results that may be interesting. Uh, remember in my scripts, I saved some results in Excel files. I will show you um, uh, the file. Uh, so that's that's what the matrix actually looks like. In the um, rows here, I have all the paragraphs, uh, 787 paragraphs, 87 because the first one is, a, is, is number zero. And in the columns here, I have 2,000 words, 2,000 most frequently used words in the essays. So I have this huge matrix here where in each of the cells I have the TFIDF metric, term frequency uh, corrected for inverse document frequency. So in the first paragraph, for example, the word wealth is never used. That's why it gets um, zero as the TFIDF score. But the word use uh, is used and the word typically is used. And uh, for each of the paragraphs here, I'm also uh, printing the pre-processed paragraph itself, the uh, name of the file where the paragraph is saved in its pre in its non-pre-processed form, uh, whether or not it was predicted as good or bad, one stands for good, zero stands for bad, and whether or not it's actually good or bad according to IB examiners. So that's my output file. And because I have this file, I was able to look at some examples of paragraphs that were classified correctly both by the examiners and my algorithm or that um, show the discrepancy in the how the IB examiners marked this essay slash paragraph and how my algorithm did. So um, and I did exactly that and I'll show you some examples of paragraphs that were marked uh, the same way by both the IB and my algorithm and that were marked differently. So here's an example of a paragraph that was marked um, highly by both the IB and my algorithm. It's saved in a document that I call Good143 uh, uh, with a combination of human sciences and artificial intelligence. The technology will improve itself through language and reason. The language is used in economics. It transformed into the vocabularies of quantities and numbers. These languages are processed using logic and, dis uh, and uh, discipline set by computer engineers and economists. These new variables added to the program can now be stored in their memory, which can be applied to a better predictive model with more accumulated data. This shows that the variables and data introduced by human sciences can improve the way the human the system functions in artificial intelligence as it becomes smarter. Very pertinent to my project. I, I'm not sure what... Um, essay title this essay was answering, uh, but still. So it looks decent, right? Um, uh, although I don't see the entire essay, you can see even from this paragraph that some knowledge concepts are brought up here, and it looks like a second order discussion of the role of art artificial intelligence in the development of human sciences. Uh, here's an example of a paragraph that was considered to be bad, both by my algorithm and by IB examiners. There were various theories suggested by this study on why it was fairly common for scientists to indirectly manipulate their data to change the results. Uh, one of these reasons for misconduct was due to the bias caused by social expectations. This type of bias was often shown in reports about criminal behavior as social expectations caused testees could be reluctant to admit to a crime they have committed even if anonymity was guaranteed. This is actually really interesting to me because the paragraph indeed sounds smart when you read it. Um, and it sounds like a paragraph about knowledge. The reason this essay on the whole was given a, a low mark by the IB, I suspect, after reading the whole essay, is because it talks about misconduct, um, which is, um, and behavior. So misconduct and behavior are all examples of behavior, not knowledge. And the focus in the paragraph is on how scientists manipulate their data. 
uh, but not on science in general, uh, which is what TOK essays should be about. So it's not about knowledge itself, it's about scientists who manipulate data. And when I read the entire essay, it kind of confirmed my expectations. It's more of a first order discussion about bad scientists that lie in their results and the reason why they lie in their results. So I'm kind of um, glad that my algorithm goes beyond the obvious and classify these paragraphs as bad, although it does contain some smart TOK words like bias and social expectations. And I suspect that the uh, trigger words that caused my algorithm to classify this paragraph as bad were words like scientists manipulate uh, misconduct, um, behavior, social expectations, uh, committed, committed a crime. Uh, if you watch the, the first part of the video where I showed you the, the 100 most different words between good TOK essays and bad TOK essays, you will, um, uh, you will see where I'm coming from. Now let's look at another paragraph that was considered bad by both my algorithm and by IB examiners. Uh, paragraph bad 239. Uh, this study instructed participants to estimate a young girl's academic performance based on the environment she was depicted in a portion of the participants were shown the girl uh, in a high socioeconomic environment, while the other participants were shown the same girl in a low socioeconomic environment. The results show that the girl in the high SES context was estimated to perform better academically. These estimations were based on the knowledge that was retrieved from schemas or other labels of the respective context. Uh, once again, you see that the paragraph actually contains some uh, TOK concepts, like right, like labels, uh, maybe even context estimations. But the algorithm kind of sees beyond that, nevertheless, and classifies the paragraph as bad. The reason is quite transparent to me. This paragraph talks about a study and about schema theory, uh, and it would be very familiar to all IB psychology students, and they would probably even recognize the study that is being described here. And it's probably the um, classical case where the student describes some studies they learned from psychology, uh, making a typical mistake to confuse psychology and TOK. And also schema theory is an overused example. Again, I'm really happy my argument actually picks this up. As an examiner, I must admit I have a similar line of reasoning. If I see that a student is describing a psychological study on a schema on schema theory and spends an entire paragraph doing so, I'm probably dealing with a descriptive essay that is regurgitating knowledge obtained from IB psychology or other IB subjects. It's not that obvious, but my algorithm seems to recognize that. And the words that were probably the, the trigger words are words like um, um, schema, maybe academic performance, because from the first uh, part of my video on the TF, on the 100 words that are most differently different between good essays and bad essays, we've seen that uh, words having to do with education are more, characteristic, are more uniquely characteristic of bad essays. Now, let's look at a paragraph that IB examiners considered to be bad, but my algorithm considered to be good. It's actually interesting to look at where my algorithm is mistaken. Uh, so I'm not going to read this whole thing because it's long. If you want to read it, you can pause the video and read. Uh, once again, this is a paragraph that IB examiners, well, the essay was marked as bad. It, it received four or below, but my algorithm considered this to be a good paragraph. Interestingly, um, when I looked uh, back at the essay itself, I saw that uh, the teacher, that student's teacher, gave this essay a seven but the IB mark was a two. Uh, well, sometimes it happens. So my algorithm got confused, but so did the teacher. And I think the problem with this particular essay was that it was too subject specific if you look at the essay on the whole. But if you read the actual paragraph, you will see that the paragraph is not too bad though. It's quite a smart paragraph written in a second order uh, fashion discussing lots of knowledge concepts and it, it actually looks like 
uh, a paragraph that comes from a really good TOK essay. It's just the reading of the entire essay makes it uh, more obvious that the focus of the essay is more on subject-specific knowledge than on knowledge in general. Um, yeah, so at this point, again, I'm glad that uh, there's a discrepancy, but it's a kind of discrepancy where a human teacher uh, also found it quite easy to be misled and, and mistaken about this essay. Uh, let's look at one other example of a paragraph that was classified as bad by IB examiners, but good but by my algorithm. Again, I'm not, I'm not going to read the whole paragraph. Um, to better understand why uh, the paragraph uh, was classified the way it was classified, you could also look at the um, words within the paragraph that, I, that have a high TF-IDF score, right? And um, the way to do that is just to go back to the matrix uh, to find paragraph bad 111. And oh, that, yeah, that's this row that I have already um, highlighted in red. So it was predicted a one by my algorithm, but it actually got bad zero from the AB. And you can just scroll and you can see which words have um, a fairly large TF-IDF score. And that could give you some um, idea, a vague understanding about why um, the paragraph was classified in a certain way. So 0 0.1 is not a large score, and I'm looking for scores that are larger than 0 0.1, probably 0 0.2 or, or, or further. So the word topic uh, has a fairly high TF-IDF score, which means that it's used in this paragraph, but not in many other paragraphs. The word teach, the word um, uh, successful to some extent, subjective to some extent, uh, and so on. I'm not going to scroll through all 2,000 words, but I did it before. And to save you the time, I'm just going to name the words uh, that have a high TF-IDF score in this paragraph. And these are the words that my algorithm probably based its decision on. The words are subjective, statement, successful, significant, shared, science, reason, project, prejudice, personal, outcome, originate, opinion, knowledge, intuition, individual, human, however, faith, education, discussion, connotation, certain, bias, avoid, aspect. So if you look at it closely, the paragraph does indeed, indeed contain lots of relevant knowledge concepts. Uh, and um, the algorithm seems to be justified in thinking that this paragraph is likely to come from a good, well-written TOK essay. The problem in this case is probably the essay on the whole. When I read this paragraph alone, it doesn't actually raise any red flags for me. For me. So I'm th at this point, I'm still quite happy because I see that the algorithm does not make any obvious mistakes. It makes mistakes, but... Uh, these kinds of mistakes might have also been made by a human teacher quite easily. Now let's look at paragraphs that IB examiners consider to be good, but my algorithm considered to be bad, which is um, the other kind of mistake, right? These ones are a little trickier, and I think I understand why my algorithm has considered these paragraphs to be bad, but of course I cannot be certain. I will, however, share my intuitions with you. So the majority of paragraphs I looked at, and I mean paragraphs that come from good essays, but my algorithm placed in the bad category, uh, they are in-depth descriptions of a particular example. I think it's the predominance of subject-specific terms that tricked my algorithm into thinking that it's not a property okay discussion about knowledge. For example, this paragraph, 214, uh, has a lot of subject-specific stuff in it. This can, of course, be developed and better linked to TOK concepts later on in the essay, but it's quite difficult to tell from a separate paragraph whether or not the student will do a good job linking the descriptions to or the examples to the actual knowledge concepts. So let's hope that the remedy for these kinds of mistakes of my algorithm is using essays instead of paragraphs and training the algorithm which I can do once I have a bigger sample of essays, right? So um, 
Overall, once again, 78% accuracy in the classification of essays as good or bad is not bad at all, given my current restrictions. And I'm happy that the algorithm does not seem to make any mistakes that are obvious or stupid. And when it does make mistakes, there seems to be a way to understand why this is happening. And if I'm right, the algorithm can become a lot better with a bigger sample of essays and uh, a better preliminary cleaning of the text and perhaps some more sophisticated statistical techniques. Uh, just to satisfy your curiosity now, um, and I think I'm going over to the additional results here. So my main result for this part of analysis is probably the 78%. And I also looked at some uh, individual paragraphs to understand um, why some misclassification uh, errors occur. But additionally, I also looked at the situation where instead of throwing out the middle, uh, that is essays that got 5 and 6 from the IB, you just draw the line between level 5 and 6, and you consider all essays that got 5 or below as bad essays, and you consider all essays that got 6 or above as good essays, which is easy to do in my script that I showed you recently. You just change one of the values there. Uh, the difficulty here, of course, is that level 5 and level 6 essays may be pretty similar essays, so it's not that easy to tell the difference between them. However, even in this case, the accuracy of the algorithm, it, it does drop, but it only drops to 72%, which I think is uh, quite an amazing result. Um, lastly, I can look at the importance matrix. Uh, which shows which words appear to be the most crucial in how my algorithm in general makes decisions. In, uh, in these worksheets here, I'm going to show you the uh, importance matrix, what it looks like. So basically, it's just a, uh, the list of the 2,000 words in my vocabulary versus uh, an estimate of uh, importance, how important, how relatively important this word is in, um, uh, in uh, well, in, in the entire algorithm of the random forest classifier. So it's pretty easy to uh, range these words from the largest importance to the, uh, to the smallest importance which I have already done, and to save you the, the trouble of going through all the technical details, I'm just going to show you the, the top most important words. Uh, and these are uh, knowledge, science, the word prove, which, by the way, is more commonly used in bad essays, uh, as you know if you watched this video from the beginning. The word history, the word however, uh, which is interesting because it's probably an indicator that the student considers counter arguments in their essays. In their essay, the word reasoning, impact, ends, truth, personal and shared knowledge. Once again, and probably knowing the um, the difference between the two, implications, theory, thus, uh, reality, perspective, researcher, A O K, area of knowledge. Psychology, which once again is more commonly um, uh, encountered in bad essays, and if you watch this video from the beginning, you know why. Uh, this actually over overlaps a lot with the conclusions that we made in part two, where we looked at TFIDF scores of different words and the hundred words that are most different between uh, good essays and bad essays. So one final thing I will do before moving over to the overall conclusions and plans for the future is comparing the accuracy of my algorithm and the accuracy of human predictions. Before the essays were sent to the IB, uh, they were all marked by us teachers internally, and these marks are essentially our human predictions of IB marks for the essay. So my big question is, how does the accuracy of our human predictions as a team of teachers compare to the accuracy of my algorithm? Is it higher or lower than 78%? And here are the results. So when I throw out the middle and I only leave essays that, that we scored 7 or above and 4 and below, the accuracy of the algorithm, as you already know, is 78%.
And for a similar scenario, my estimated accuracy for the team of human teachers is 69%, which makes it obvious that the algorithm has outperformed us. When I don't throw out the middle and I just draw the line between uh, level 5 and level 6, such that all essays that scored 5 and below are considered bad, and all essays that scored 6 and above are considered good, the accuracy of the algorithm is, as you know, 72%, and the accuracy uh, of us human teachers, of human predictions, is only 59%. And again, the algorithm has outperformed human teachers. How cool is that? Um, obviously, there are lots of limitations with this kind of analysis, and by no means can we make any generalizations from these results. Uh, to start with, my sample was only 109 essays from one school. Uh, and my algorithm was trained on 80% of these essays. Uh, and for these 80% of the essays, my algorithm already knew the correct IB marks. And human teachers didn't have such a luxury. It is as if they didn't have a training set at all. Um, so human teachers are at a disadvantage here. And we probably can't compare accuracy directly like that. It would actually be better to compare the accuracy of my algorithm to the accuracy of IB examiners who have been already trained in some essays that were already pre-marked. Uh, furthermore, my algorithm is trained on paragraphs and not actually on essays, uh, which is a little weird, but that was necessary in my little project uh, due to the sample size. However, even with all these limitations in mind, it is still quite impressive that a machine can outperform an average human teacher in a task like reading and marking a TOK essay, a totally human job from the point of view of common sense. I believe the accuracy of human predictions in my sample is quite representative of any team of TOK teachers in any international school. Uh, it's not the first time when machines outperform humans in something that seems like a human job. In fact, you'll be surprised in how many other domains similar things have happened. If you want to know more, there's a cool book by Ian Ayres called Super Crunchers, Why Thinking by Numbers is the New Way to Be Smart. I will add a link below the video in the, in the description. So I will show you this main result once again, just to let it uh, sink in. The accuracy of the algorithm is 78% currently, and the accuracy of us human teachers is 69%. So I do think it's a very promising result of uh, automatic essay scoring, even in these simplified conditions. And I'm very curious to see if this will replicate if we actually increase the sample size from my 100 essay to, say, a couple of thousand essays or something like that. Over to uh, key conclusions. Okay, it's time to formulate some key overall conclusions from this entire project. In the beginning of this video, in the introductory part, I described the rationale behind the project and my objective. An examiner marking a TOK essay is a human expert who makes an expert judgment. We know from research that expert judgments are notoriously difficult to verbalize and explain. They're based to a large extent on implicit rules and heuristics, which comprise expert intuition. This is not to say that these judgments are unreliable, and the IB indeed has procedures in place to ensure that examiners mark to the same standard. I'm only saying that these implicit rules and heuristics are difficult to explain to someone else, and in many cases, they're so implicit that experts themselves may be unaware of them. This is probably especially true in IBTOK, where the assessment instrument that is being used is based on the idea of general impression marking. So my objective was, in the spirit of knowledge engineering, to use machine learning and artificial intelligence to hack into the brains of IB examiners and understand, with the help of the machine, the implicit rules that examiners may be using when marking essays. It's a major task and I didn't have enough data, so this whole project is just a pilot study that was designed to see if such a project would even make sense. 
in the introductory part of this video, I also described the main techniques that I was going to use to achieve my goals. These are all techniques of natural language processing and machine learning. The term frequency inverse document frequency metric, topic modeling using the LDA model, which stands for latent Dirichlet allocation, and supervised binary classification using such methods of machine learning as random forests. Supervised binary classification is just a fancy way of expressing the idea of deciding whether a particular essay is good or bad after being trained in a bunch of essays whose marks you already knew. My sample was the tiny miserable collection of 190 OK essays from my own school, nowhere close to a proper machine learning project, but you have to start somewhere. The project itself in this video was described in four parts. In part one, I described the pre-processing that I have done on all the texts, such as removing special symbols, lemmatization, and removing all words that are not nouns, verbs, adjectives, or adverbs. It is important that your artificial intelligence is trained on, is trained on clean data without artifacts. I have managed to do some things programmatically. For example, my script turns all words into their basic forms, also known as lemmas. And I have learned how to split essays automatically into paragraphs and save each paragraph into a separate file. However, there is still a lot, a lot to improve. For example, I had to remove bibliography from all essays manually, and they still have to figure out how to do that automatically. In part two, I described the results of a simple numerical analysis using the so-called TFIDF metric. It stands for Term Frequency Inverse Document Frequency. With this metric, I tried to find out which words or combinations of words are used in good essays more frequently than in bad essays. Some words are only used in good essays and very rarely appear in bad essays and vice versa. And I tried to uncover these unique words. I showed you 100 words that I identified as the most different between good TOK essays and bad TOK essays. These were very curious. Examples of words more frequently used in good essays include intelligence, perspective, reasoning, reality, premise, shared and personal, inductive, objective, absolute, useful, truth, simplification, prediction, standard, methodology, implication. These are not all just words, obviously. This is an indicator of the fact that good essays use more analysis of knowledge concepts, clearly show understanding of the difference between shared and personal knowledge, and so on. One curious word that is more frequently used in good essays is the word perhaps. If you want to know the full list of words, go back and watch that part of the video. In part three, I described results of topic modeling using the technique of latent Dirichlet allocation. I used automatic topic recognition to identify the common topics discussed in TOK essays, and then try and, and compare good and bad essays in terms of the most frequently occurring topics. I did not tell the machine which topics the essays were based on, and the machine had to discover these topics by itself, based on groups of words that commonly occur together. The cool parts about this analysis were the visualizations. The model was pretty successful in automatically identifying the common themes. It kind of discovered the prescribed essay titles without knowing these titles beforehand. Some prescribed essay titles naturally overlap, uh, meaning that students talked about similar things in response to these titles. The one about statistics, for example, and the one about labels stand more clearly apart from the rest. One major difference between good and bad TOK essays is that in, in bad essays, examples are not so well linked to the concepts. Topics in good essays are more overlapping and topics in bad essays are more distinctly separate from each other. A good essay will describe an example and then at the end of the same paragraph, provide a comprehensive explanation of how this example relates to the knowledge concepts that are being discussed. That's why the model automatically picks up a combination of two topics in this single paragraph. Bad essays are more similar to each other in terms of examples that they use. These are mostly trivial overused examples such as COVID in essays about statistics or anti-vaxxers or Donald Trump 
flat earth and so on. By contrast, good essays use more sophisticated and complicated examples, such as particle physics in response to the question about labels. If you want to know more results like these ones or see the cool visualizations of automatically discovered topics in TOK essays, go back and watch the relevant parts of this video. And finally, in part four, I described the pinnacle of this entire project. Essentially, I tried to train an algorithm to automatically mark TOK essays by discovering the implicit rules and heuristics used by IB examiners and by imitating the way an examiner's brain works when they're reading your essay. I also compared this to the accuracy of marks given by human teachers. This is a case of supervised classification task. The technique I used is the random forest classifier. I used a collection of paragraphs coming from good essays, that is ones that scored seven or above, and paragraphs coming from bad essays, that is ones that scored four or below. I was able to train an algorithm that classifies paragraphs correctly into good and bad with a 78% accuracy. When I tried to divide the essays by drawing the line between five and six, uh, meaning level five is considered to be a bad essay, whereas level six is already considered to be a good essay, the accuracy dropped to 72%, but it was still pretty impressive. I looked at individual paragraphs and I tried to understand why the algorithm classifies them as either good or bad. And it does seem like the algorithm does a meaningful job. There are no obvious or stupid mistakes. And where the algorithm is mistaken, a human could probably be mistaken too. I also looked at words that appear to be the most important or the most crucial in the decisions made by the algorithm. Some of the most important ones are knowledge, science, Prove, which is, by the way, more frequently met in bad essays. However, reasoning, impact, hence, truth, personal and shared knowledge, implication, theory, thus, reality, perspective. When I compared the accuracy of the algorithm to the accuracy of human predictions, it appears that the algorithm does a better job than the average human teacher, whose accuracy was only about 69%. It's quite amazing. Again, if you want to know the details, go back and watch that part of the video. So what next? I think this pilot project has definitely shown that the project needs to continue. There seems to be a lot of potential in human teachers and examiners and the machine learning algorithm working together. I'm not saying that the machine can replace human examiners. In fact, my algorithm actually tries to imitate the way of reasoning of human examiners. So it needs human examiners because it learns from them. Question is, can human examiners benefit from this algorithm once it has been trained? And I think the answer is yes, immensely. I will continue expanding my sample and perfecting the algorithm and hopefully in the future, it will become even more accurate. In the meantime, if you want to send me an essay, if you're curious to see how my algorithm will mark it, please do. My algorithm is still young, but it already has opinions. If you have any comments or questions or objections in response to this little summer project of mine, please let me know. These will all be very valuable because it's all very new. And I don't think anyone has tried using artificial intelligence to read and mark TOK essays before. So I'm finding my way in the dark. Thank you for watching, especially if you survived this entire video or at least separate parts of it. And I will see you next time.